Hello everyone, welcome back to My Hero Academia Podfix. This will be the continuation of UA Survival Guide. This will be Part 19, Chapter 19. Nothing at school changes between Kachan and Izuku on Monday, or any day after. Izuku had expected it, but he's not sure if he's glad or upset that nothing changes. They'd sort of had a heart-to-heart, -heart, just in their own odd way, but Kachan had told him up front that things weren't going to change much. Still, the green-haired teenager returns the borrowed earbud, leaving it on Kachan's desk after he arrives early that Monday with his guardians. When Izashi is home in the mornings, they arrive to school much earlier than when it's just Izuku and Shota. Izuku thinks it's a bit funny, his teacher always on their case about tardiness and being on time, and he's the one that's always in danger of being late. While the others are seemingly carefree and boisterous English teacher, he's entirely punctual. Kachan doesn't so much as look back at Izuku when he spots the lone earbud, just slips it into one of his pockets of his backpack and collapses in his seat, but not without glaring back over Izuku's shoulder like he's trying to spot Oboro, who, at the time, wasn't even in the room. Though things don't change between them, Kachan's attitude towards Izuku does take the faintest step upwards. He's still not nice, no nicer than he is to any of their other classmates, but he's not as blatantly rude or hostile anymore. It's hardly noticeable, as you could doubt their peers will be able to spot the difference in Kachan's aggressive personality, at least when it comes to their green-haired classmate, but to Izuku it means the world. It's not a lot, but it's change, and it's change in the right direction. Maybe at some point they can actually be friends again, have civil conversations. Maybe at some point Izuku will feel at ease joining the Bakugos in their home again, but for now the progress is micro, but appreciated. And although he still calls Izuku Deku, the nickname is softened a little around the edges as well when it comes from Kachan. It's in no way a nice nickname still, but it comes off nicer than it had before, and that's a step up too. Izuku doesn't forgive Kachan entirely. He hadn't said sorry for the things he'd done, or anything over the years, but he seemed to now realize it wasn't exactly right. But even if Kachan did say sorry, that doesn't change the fact that he'd suicide-baited Izuku and bullied him for the better part of their lives when their parents weren't around. Izuku wonders if Kachan talks about him with Hound Dog. He hadn't broached the subject yet, but he probably needs to at some point. Maybe it would be nice to get it off his chest without naming names. He really doesn't want Kachan to have any additional repercussions, as Awa Sensei had already dealt a punishment for him. And the ashy-haired teen was going to counseling, which Izuku thought he'd never see. Sure, Kachan had been wrong and a bully, but Izuku knew in the deepest pits of his heart that the blonde would one day become a damn good hero. So no, nothing really changes in their relationship. Well, besides maybe one thing. Kachan's gaze seems to occasionally sweep over the classroom, usually around Izuku, as if expecting to spot something. Izuku doesn't even really notice it at first, when Kachan's head would angle, eyes narrowed, and nose wrinkled like something was physically offending him. After the first couple times, Izuku takes notice and puts the pieces together. Kachan only scowls when being caught looking around for an entity that he knows he won't be able to see, but still completely believes is around. And Obero flat out cackles when he realizes the development, too. From then on, Kachan's pens and pencils and any other writing utensil rolls directly off his desk whenever they're put down, even if just for a second. Obero watches the writing utensils that Kachan has like a hawk, swooping in like a cat whenever he sees an opportunity to flick things off the desk, watching them roll onto the floor in satisfaction. Izuku doesn't have the heart to tell the ghost off, and Kachan doesn't really have any idea of what's going on, hasn't pieced it together yet, so Izuku lets the ghost take his frustrations about Kachan out on him, at least until Kachan realizes that his desk isn't uneven or slanted. Maybe he should at least tell Kachan that Obero only joins them in two of their core classes, but he won't lie and say it's not entertaining to see the ashen-haired teen jerking his gaze around when the lights above so much as flicker. The days carry on. Another week in the heroics class passes, Wednesday, the two-week trial deadline approaches and passes. Izuku's social worker drops in at the apartment Wednesday, almost directly after school, for the home inspection that she'd mentioned, and Izuku is who's encouraged to show her around. Shota and Hizashi trail along behind the social worker, and Oboro thankfully stays in the guest room that Izuku supposes he can now call his own room. Considering the couple of items, hero merch that he's selected from the boxes to liven up the place at Hizashi's insistence, Izuku's a nervous wreck as he shows her around, internally cursing a stutter that hasn't been as bad as it had been in literally years. The cats weave underfoot, almost as if sensing his unease, and he narrowly misses stepping on Blanket, who stops directly in front of Izuku and flops onto his side for attention. The teen stumbles as he steps beside the cat instead of on him, 
quick to reach down and pick the fluffy beast up, cuddling the easygoing demon to his chest as he continues on the tour. At some point in the tour, his social worker and guardians take pity on him, and Hazashi steps up to take the lead. Azuku falls back with Shota, who leads them into the living room, and gently eases him onto the couch by a calloused hand on his shoulder. Izuku listens from his spot as Hazashi talks on about how the household has changed for the new addition, like the locks they'd locked the cabinet in the kitchen. Izuku hadn't even noticed there was the lock, but then again, he'd never searched out alcohol, plus he's too short to reach the cabinet above the fridge anyways. Similarly, medications had been locked away, which Izuku can't help but frown at. He understands it's just for the visit, really. He's no danger to himself unless he's using one for all, but it's still upsetting that his social worker doesn't trust him at all. His pain relief pill from Recovery Girl, that he no longer needs, had sat on the kitchen counter and neither guardian had seemed worried about it. They trust him. It's dumb that this woman gets to make all these decisions for him, even when she hardly knows him. They talk more about him, sitting around the kitchen table like Azuku isn't in the adjoining room. They talk of the sports festival, his injuries, his medications, his physical exam with Recovery Girl, and even his sessions with Hound Dog that are still happening. Izuku glares down at the purring cat in his lap as the woman pries into his life. Until finally, finally, the woman agrees that Izuku is in capable hands with his teachers and as his guardians. Shota signs the paperwork as the main guardian, and Hisashi as secondary. They have equal standing, but since Shota was his initial guardian when it came to the emergency fostering, it's just easier to extend that and add Hisashi in separately. The woman finally leaves later in the evening with a warning of surprise visits and wellness checks on her lips. They'd all expected it. The three of them gather around as she leaves, sending her off with grateful smiles. I'm too stressed to cook, Hazashi huffs out after a beat as soon as the door shuts behind the woman. Who's up for some celebratory takeout? You're officially ours, Izuku. Yes, Obro cheers from Izuku's bedroom, but doesn't make an appearance. Izuku can't help it when his smile widens at Obro's cheer. Hazashi moves in, wrapping Izuku in a welcome hug. The teen melts into it, squeezing his official guardian back. He feels giddy and excited, relieved. He gets to stay, almost as if reading his thought, Hisashi continues, voice softening as he presses his nose into Izuku's curls. You're here to stay, sweetheart. Look, even Sho's got a smile. I don't, the dark-haired man huffs, voice coming out tired and fond. Izuku feels Shota's fingers tangle in his curls, too, and Hisashi's teasing laugh vibrates Izuku where he's still clutched to the man in a chest hug. Welcome home, problem child. And he's definitely not tearing up. Nope, definitely not. Th thank you. Nothing else really changes after the stamp of approval from the social worker. The week carries on. Classes are the same as usual. The only thing that's different is the relief in the teen's chest whenever he makes his way back to the apartment or settles down in the bed. His bed. He's here to stay for a while. Shota tells them of the upcoming offers for select students who caught the eye of heroes and agencies during the festival. He mentions it, but doesn't add much detail yet. He informs them that they need time to sift through the offers and get in contact with any and all parties that are interested before actually letting the students select where they want to intern. At home, Izuku sees Shota hunched over his laptop in most of his free time. He's always got what appears to be an endless mug of coffee, and his expression flickers between scowling and frowning as he reads through internship requests. Not every student in 1A will be getting them, and Izuku knows that some students will get more attention than others, but... He still can't help but hope that he gets one, or two himself, even if he hadn't actually placed. Still, Izuku doesn't ask, and his teacher doesn't tell. Their classes continue on with a little bit of normalcy. They work hard with their quirks, the festival had been eye-opening for some of them. It really put into perspective where everyone needed to focus their attention when it came to improving. None of them had been perfect. On Friday, Aizawa-sensei promises that on Monday he'll finally reveal the internship requests to those affected and let them select where they want to go if they have more than one agency interested. Saturday morning is odd. Obero is in his room reading when Izuku wakes up. After the plate incident with Shota, the ghost had been focusing his energy on random items around the apartment, but he seems to have the best results in guest rooms where Izuku stays. The ghost isn't good at picking things up and holding them, but he has gotten good at pinching pieces of paper between his fingers, so as of recent, Obero has been spending his time reading. Izuku wakes to the ghost at the desk, hunched over a book he'd requested Izuku snag from the shelving unit in the main living space. His eyes scan over the words, and when he reaches the end, it takes a good minute or so for the ghost to focus on the pages and his own fingers enough to turn it. It's a process. Izuku throws his covers off with a yawn, ignoring the way that the blanket shifts until blanket the cat, 
His head emerges. Fish is at the back of the bed, tail swaying as the cat glares at Oboro. Nemo still spends very little time in Izuku's room, and the green-haired teen can only wonder what Oboro had done to piss the cat off so much that she avoids room season in general. Morning. Oboro throws a wave over his shoulder without looking up from the book. Hey, Izuku greets in return, rubbing the sleep from his eyes. I'm going to go get some breakfast. I'll be here, the ghost hums out, eyes focused on the corner of the page where he's hovering his fingers. The rest of the apartment is quiet, and for a second Izuku thinks that maybe Shota and Hazashi had stepped out for a morning run, for errands or something. But to his surprise, he finds them both sat at the kitchen table. Neither notice him. Shota's head is down, arms pillowing his head, even though Izuku's sure that the man's forehead is on the hardwood. His hair is down, still wearing his sweats and the shirt that he had gone to sleep in the night before. One of his hands is loosely curled around his coffee mug, the dark liquid untouched but no longer steaming. Weird. Hisashi looks off, too, his hair pulled into a messy bun as he's still wearing his sleeping clothes like Shota. He's leaning heavily on the table, too, elbows supporting his body, and his head ducked silently as he is glaring down at the table. His mug is grasped between his hands, cooled off as well, but it's only half full as opposed to Shota's full cup. Hisashi is staring off into space, eyes locking on nothing, almost unseeing. There's a downward curl to his lips, and his thumb trails along the ceramic of his mug thoughtlessly. Izuku must make a noise of surprise, or maybe he shifts or something, because a second later Hisashi's gaze is lulling towards the teen, and he's forcing a tiny smile. Morning, sunshine, Hisashi greets. Good morning. Izuku shuffles slightly before deciding to step into the kitchen. Hisashi's gaze follows him as he makes his way into the counter, pulling open the snack cupboard to select something quick and easy to eat. He'd been sleeping in lately. He's going to have to get back on track with his morning run soon. The teen reaches blindly into the jelly pouch box and manages to pull out a peach flavored. And when he turns back, neither man has moved. Hisashi, looking down at his mug, Shota hasn't stirred at all. It's not strange per se. They don't watch him, but they do tend to glance at what he's up to, usually. But neither really moves. And that's when Izuku decides that something is wrong. Hisashi hadn't complained about Izuku eating a jelly pouch for breakfast. Something is definitely wrong. The kitchen feels heavy, but it's only now that he'd noticed that his guardian's sour moods that really fills in around him. It's different than any other time Izuku had been here since moving in with the teachers. It's heavy and almost suffocating. Sad. But why? Are you guys all right? Izuku's eyebrows furrow as Hisashi looks toward him again. Shota doesn't really move, still. Doesn't even lift his head at being addressed, but his shoulders do shift a little as he breathes. Where? Hisashi bites his lip, looking at his husband before returning his gaze to Izuku. His expression softens, a little, as he manages another tiny smile that looks wrong on his face. It's a sad day, kiddo. Oh, Izuku breathes out. He gives a light nod. Doesn't really understand, but at the same time he does. He wants to ask questions, but he also doesn't want to pry. They're sad. He's not sure why, but they are, and they probably don't want to deal with him right now anyways. I'm sorry. Don't be, Shota speaks, voice coming out gravelly, almost sounding emotional. He doesn't lift his head. We're fine, problem child. It's just not a good day. We'll be right as rain tomorrow, listener. Don't worry your little head, you dig? Oh, the teen repeats, just because he's not sure what to say. He fidgets with the jelly pouch, not looking at either of them. I, I'm i going to go eat this in my room. I've got some homework. Okay, Hizashi nods, voice soft in a way that Izuku's never heard before. The man tucks a stray clump of golden hair behind his ear as he continues. If you need any help with your English homework, let me know. Uh, okay. The teen bows his head before scampering out of the room. He doesn't dawdle as he makes his way back into the guest room where Oboro hasn't moved. The ghost's tongue is poked out in concentration as he glares down at his book, but Izuku's nerves get the better of him, and before he can stop himself, he's blurting out, There's something wrong with my teachers. Oboro pouts wherein his concentration is broken, but he turns to the teen with his head cocked in interest. Oh? I'll need more than that. What happened? See for yourself. Izuku gestures to the doorway heart pounding in his chest as he sits on the bed. Fish still hasn't moved from the edge of the bed, so Izuku strokes the cat's head in an attempt to calm himself down. The cat makes a little purr noise before butting his head against Izuku's hand in an attempt to demand more. Obro shoots Izuku an odd look, 
before doing as told and disappearing through the closed bedroom door. He's not gone long, maybe ten seconds before he's back with a perplexed look. Yeah, that's weird, the ghost agrees. Did they say anything? Just that it's a sad day, Zuku frowns as he racks his brain for anything that might be of use. Zuku's words have Obero freezing up, his own frown deepening as he looks in the direction of the kitchen briefly before his eyes are back on Izuku, clouded with some unfamiliar emotion. What? What's the date? The date? Izuku bristles in surprise. Takes just a second for Izuku to figure out the date off the top of his head. Yesterday had been the fourth, so today's obviously the fifth. Uh, it's the fifth. May fifth. Ah. Obro turns away, slumping back to his book. He drops down heavily in the desk chair, glaring down at the book. That explains it. Explains what? Izuku demands lightly. What's wrong? What What happened? Why are they upset? Obro turns back to Izuku, gaze surveying over him before the ghost gives a little half-smile, angling his head to the side. The half-smile is sad, but accepting. It only makes Izuku more confused, until Obero says, It's my birthday. Izuku's brain screeches to a halt. It was Obero's birthday? Why hadn't he known? Why hadn't the ghost told him? It's... R really? Izuku gets a hum of confirmation from Obero, as his head is bowing the slightest into a nod as he glares down at the book before him. His hands are settled in his lap, and he no longer looks tempted to try reading any more. The energy that fills the room is not the same energy that's in the kitchen. It's sad, but not downright depressing and suffocating like his teachers. It's like... defeat? But it's accepted. Happy birthday! Isuku's lips curl down in a light frown as he fiddles with the jelly pouch in his hands. Obro swirls around in the chair to gape at Izuku, and Izuku can just jump in surprise as the emotions flickering through the ghost's awestruck gaze. A sinking feeling settles in Izuku's heart. Obro looks shocked and touched at the words, simple words that Izuku had muttered out of habit. It's the first thing you do when someone tells you it's their birthday, right? Acknowledge it. Acknowledge them. Birthdays are special. Most people want to feel special and noticed. Remembered. Th thanks, Izu. Obro's voice is heavy with... Izuku's not quite sure. Sadness, relief, desperation. Maybe a bit of joy at hearing the words, too. It's been a while since... The ghost clears his throat. You know, nobody... No one wishes someone that's not around a happy birthday. It's kind of pointless. And ouch, Izuku sucks in a breath. Obro had been around all these years, had clung close to and stayed, and every year his birthday had passed. Izuku can only imagine what happens each year based on what he'd seen in the kitchen. The ghost friends clammed up, and the atmosphere dropped into a chilling, depressing state. The memory is there, but it's not light and cheerful. It's dark and sad and regretful. Izuku doubts that Obro had heard the words since he'd died all those years ago, when his teachers were students at the school they now teach at. I'm sorry. Izuku shakes his head until his Unruly curls fall into his eyesight, blocking his view of the room and the ghost still watching him. I've never even thought about... Is it like this every year? Don't be. Obro blows out, standing out of the chair to settle beside Izuku on the bed. The ghost's back presses against the headboard, one leg outstretched along the mattress, just shy of touching Izuku's thigh, and his other foot is settled on the ground still. It's really not your fault. When Izuku glances to the side, he sees a small smile on Obero's face. It wavers slightly before he's looking away and clearing his throat again. It's gotten better, honestly. The ghost informs him, fiddling with his own fingers. It used to be... bad. They used to get... God, they were so upset. It sucked, you know? To, to see them so sad and angry. Mad at the world and hurt over... over me. Izuku tried to keep his own raging heart under control as the ghost talked. It's been a long time now, and I know that they're still upset on my birthday and and the day I died, but it's it's not like it was years ago, thankfully. It doesn't hurt them as much. It's isn't as fresh. I'm just glad that they remember me still, even if it's mostly guilt and regret. A, a sad thing. It's nice to not be forgotten. Isuka personally doesn't see anything nice about this. This hurts him, and he's not technically a part of it. It's something that he shouldn't even see. His quirk has given him something that no one else has, and in that, it also opened up a world of hurt that he's never even thought could exist. He aches for both his guardians and the ghost before him. This is... it sucks. He hates it. I'm sorry, Izuku croaks out when he can't find anything else to say. 
Mobro cocks a head in his direction, expression brightening a little from the contemplative frown that he had been wearing. It's not all bad, the ghost tells him softly, a smile a little fond. Everyone still gets together for me every year. Like, Sho and Zashi sometimes host our other school friends, and my birthday is the only time of year that my family all gets together. Really? Izuku sniffles, frowning at Obro's broadening smile. Yep, he nods enthusiastically. I have three brothers and two sisters. They're all older than me. Then there's my parents, and I have nieces and nephews, too. After I died, they... My parents moved the family, and it's a... Well, it's a commute, even for a ghost, but... Since they all meet up, I try and go when I remember it's my birthday, so I can check up on everyone and and see the new family members if there are any new babies. That sounds... it sounds nice, Zuku swallows. That's a big family. Yeah, the ghost gives an enthusiastic nod, shooting Izuku a dopey grin. But a big family means that they never really have a chance to get everyone together for anything. But every year, without fail, they get together for me. I'm glad that I'm a part of it, even if I'm not actually a part of it. It's a little sad. I know they miss me too, but it's its not like my friends get. Kids are perceptive, and my family tries to make me a happy memory for the little ones. That's sweet. Izuku can't help but smile. Does that mean you're going to visit them then? If you don't mind, Obro cocks his head. Sho and Zashi are... We were close, not to say I wasn't close to my family, but I think I... My death hit them differently. I don't really know how they'll be. Sometimes they have a couple drinks, sometimes they're just blah, I guess. Depends on the day, really. Will you be all right if I go? It's your birthday, Mizuka reminds with a smile. You do what you want. I trust them, and however they need to cope is all right with me. I mean, worse comes to worse, I just hang out in here, right? If you're sure, Obro narrows his eyes, scanning Izuku up and down as if searching for any hesitance. I'll be back in a couple of hours when the kids are no longer around and no one stays out too late, you know? Izuku nods, finally opening his jelly pouch and taking a couple slurps of it. Take your time. Have fun. Maybe you can tell me about your family later if you want. I love hearing about quirks. Yeah, sure. The ghost chirps, almost vibrating with enthusiasm. I'll keep an eye out for any cool quirks that the little ones might have. I'm sure there's some awesome new ones. Obro's gotten off the bed at this point, jumping around the room like an overexcited toddler. He's grinning, a bright contrast to his earlier look when he'd realized what day it was, but... Nothing more than a glance at Izuku's teacher's state. The ghost gives Izuku an enthusiastic wave before he blinks out of existence, leaving Izuku alone with a cat glaring skeptically at where the ghost had just been. Izuku lets out a laugh as he brushes Fish's ears back. For a while after getting the jelly pouch, Izuku stays in his room with Blanket and Fish. The cat seemed content to just laze on the bed, and even Nemo paws under the door in a request to be a part of it. Izuku thinks that she might be mad that Shota isn't giving her as much attention as she's used to. Izuku's not sure how the cat knows the ghost is gone, but he doesn't hesitate to open the door and let her in, taking a second to peer out and see if he can hear anything from his guardians. He can't. He doubts that they've moved from the kitchen table. He works on his homework, until it's all finished, or most of it is at least. He's having a little trouble with the English concepts that they've been assigned, but Izuku will definitely not be bothering Hizashi today not after hearing just why his teachers appeared so off. When his homework is finished, Izuku eases back in the chair, staring up at the ceiling as he lets out a heavy sigh. It rattles out of his lungs. It's nearing lunchtime now. Izuku's debating leaving his guardians to grieve the birthday of their school friend alone. That's, there's not really a lot that he can say or do in this situation without outing himself and his odd quirk. He doesn't want to do that, but he also doesn't want to butt his head into something that he really shouldn't be a part of, because technically he doesn't really know Obero, or the Obero that his teachers know, at least. Still, he knows he can't just stay in his room the whole day. He doesn't want to upset his guardians more, and he knows not eating will do that. He'd gotten lucky when it came to no one mentioning the jelly pouch for breakfast, but he's sure that he'll have complaints if he doesn't eat anything for lunch. So, with another breathier and more anxious sigh, the teenager opens the door. None of the cats stir, but he still leaves the door an inch or so more open so they don't feel trapped, because they will scream. The apartment is still quiet, but a quick glance down at the end of the hallway shows his guardian's bedroom door is still open, meaning they're probably still in the main living area. Izuku pauses at the end of the hallway, frowning at his teachers. They moved into the living room now, settled on the couch together. Shota sprawled on his stomach down, alongside the couch, with his face buried in Hazashi's lap. 
Hisashi slumped down too, elbow resting on the armrest of the couch and the side of his jaw cradled in his palm. The TV is on, mumbling softly, but neither seems to be watching it. Isuku realizes with a start that the photo of Obero is the one that he'd found on the shelf with the three of them together. It's now on the coffee table, lying face down like neither of them could bear to look at it. He wonders for just a second why the photo is even down if they'd laid it face down, but he knows that loss is a messy emotion. The thought tugs at the teenager's heartstrings. Isuku sucks in a breath as he holds it to not disturb them, and he slips into the kitchen. He scrounges around in the fridge, pulling out some leftover onigiri that Hisashi made for bento lunches the day prior. He takes a bite into the rice ball as he sets to work, grabbing the kettle. Tea sounds nice, maybe some green tea or matcha if he can find it. He hesitates for just a second before moving swiftly to the doorway. It takes more effort than it probably should for the teenager to open his mouth, and it actually is hard to get the sounds out. Would, um... Isuku swallows as Hisashi's gaze sweeps towards him. He even showed his head angles up a little, so his chin is digging into Hisashi's thigh. Would you guys like some tea? Tea? Shota's voice comes out gravelly, one eyebrow arching. Uh-huh. Isuku taps a finger against his thigh. You guys are just... Well, you're sad, right? It's just, I, uh, used to... I mean, when my mom was... When she was upset, I would bring her tea, and it would help her feel better. Izuku stares down at the ground as he clenches his hands into fists at his side. There's a stretch of silence that feels like it drags on, but Izuku knows it's probably no longer than a second, maybe two. He doesn't know why he's so anxious. These are his teachers, and literally the worst outcome here is them declining the offer. But he's apparently worried for nothing. I'd love some tea, kiddo. Izashi straightens up a little, his smile coming off a bit more naturally than it had earlier. Izuku finds himself returning it. Shota lets out a sigh, shifting so he's on his side instead of his stomach, head still pillowed in Hisashi's lap. Yeah, kid. The man runs a hand through his hair. Thanks. Izuku nods quickly, retreating to the kitchen. He finishes off his rice ball between gathering the tea, mugs, and sweeteners and waiting for the kettle to boil. Izuku had seen the men drinking tea a couple of times since he started staying here with them and memorized little things about people, so he knows what they like in their tea or coffee. It's something Izuku's always been good at, so he doesn't even need to ask how they like it. Surprisingly, Shota likes black tea with a frankly worrying amount of sweetener, whereas Hizashi prefers like an herbal tea sweetened faintly with honey. It's good for the vocal cords, Hizashi had told him enthusiastically one of the first days that Izuku stayed with him. Izuku thinks Hizashi must know all the tips and tricks for keeping your throat healthy. He wonders briefly how Hizashi's quirk influences his vocal cords. Does it require special care? Is the strain bad when he overuses it? Would his quirk still work if he lost his voice? Can he lose his voice? Izuku shakes himself from his thoughts as he settles on herbal tea for himself, a green tea blend. He drops two green tea bags into the mugs, one that Hizashi uses every morning, and the other mug he'd found shoved into the back of the cupboard, the third mug, a mug with little paw prints and a parade of cats circling the entirety of it that Shota tended to use. It gets a black tea bag. When the kettle is boiling, Izuku pours over the tea bags and gives all three a stir before letting them steep. Shota likes his tea the same that he likes his coffee, bitter. It's contradicted by the spoonful of sugar and the splash of cream he likes as opposed to the straight-up black coffee he drinks. Izuku himself likes his tea to be a little weak, so it's the first tea bag he removes. He spoons some honey into his own mug and takes a sip as he waits for the other two. Hisashi likes his tea to steep for the allotted time on the box, so when the time, however, many minutes pass, Izuku removes Hisashi's as well, and adds the faintest amount of honey to it. He then takes Shota's last, adding in the sugar and cream before grabbing both his guardian's mugs and walking carefully into the living room. Shota has sat up now, but he's still tucked into Hisashi's side, the blonde's arm hooked over Shota's shoulder as his thumb brushes along his collarbone. Izuku pretends he's not surprised that his stony-faced, scrumpy teacher is this much of a cuddler as he sets the two mugs on the coffee table. He gets two thank yous, one from Hisashi accompanied with a wide, thankful smile, while Shotis comes out gruff and exhausted, but with just as much gratitude. He makes a beeline back into the kitchen, grabbing his own tea before pausing in the doorway. You're welcome to join us, problem child. Mizuku startles at Shota's monotone voice. The teen's attention shoots between the couch where Hisashi is glancing back at him while Shota sips at his mug of tea, and the hallway leading back to the bedrooms. Are you sure? 
Azuku squeaks out, shifting his weight from foot to foot. I don't want to... I don't mind staying in my room if, if you guys need to be alone. Or... Nonsense, listener. Hazashi shakes his head, another soft but honest smile on his face. We're not going to force you to come out if you don't want to, but don't isolate yourself if it's because you think we want you to. We won't, and never will, send you away for any reason. Sad or not, you dig? This is your home too, kid. Shota huffs out over the rim of his mug. You're welcome anywhere, anytime. We enjoy your company, problem child. Don't feel like you have to do anything to please us. Just know you're always invited to join us whenever you'd like. Right, Hizashi gives a firm nod of agreement. And if we did want to be alone, which may or may not happen at some point, we do so in our room. You're always allowed out here, in the living room, in the kitchen. That said, never hesitate to come get us if you need us, listener. Just knock first if we're in our room. Shota's lips curl into a tiny smirk, and Izuku doesn't even want to think about what that means, especially when Hazashi squawks and lightly smacks Shota's shoulder. What? Shota has a playful drawl, undeterred by his husband, as he hides a small smile behind his mug. It's common courtesy to knock, isn't it? Don't say things like that, Hazashi glares playfully at Shota, pinching the dark-haired man's shoulder lightly. I literally didn't say anything bad. Shota snorts into his cup, smile never waning. It was solid advice. Maybe not, but you implied it, the blonde pouts. Not to mention you definitely thought something bad, and around our child, too. You spend way too much time with Namuri. I'm not the one who invites her over all the time, so that's on you, Zashi. Isuku can't help the soft exhale of laughter, which brings him back to how he's awkwardly stood in the doorway clutching a mug of tea. He doesn't really want to head back to his room. It's a little boring, and without Oboro, he's kind of lonely. It's very rare for Izuku to be completely alone these days. He's not really sure what to do over himself when he is. So that fleeting thought seals his decision for him. He takes slow, hesitant steps into the living room, settling himself on the love seat. Neither guardian pays him much attention as he does so, and he's glad. He's honestly waiting for them to tell him that they changed their mind, and either they leave or ask him to, but it doesn't happen. The TV's playing some show Azuka's never seen before, the volume on low, murmuring faintly in the background. The three of them sit in comfortable silence, all sipping at their teas. So, listener, Izuku looks up from his mug to see the two of them looking at him. He shifts a little, but cocks his head in question. Since this is your home, too, now, we were wondering how you'd feel if we invited someone over later. We usually... This time of year, we have a couple of friends over. Izuku blinks, looking between the two of them. It's your call, Shota continues with a half-hearted, one-shoulder shrug. We understand this is a lot to adjust to, and you deserve some peace and quiet in your new environment. Numuri won't mind, and if she does... We can always meet her somewhere else or head to her place. You have a say here, problem child. Izuku pauses, eyes drifting down to the tea in thought. He really has no right to deny them this, wouldn't even if he truly trusted their words. They could tell him it's just as much as home as it is theirs, but that's not really true. And besides all that, he'd never deny them this. It's the birthday of their high school friend who lost his life. It's Obro's birthday. Obro had told him that his school friends got together to remember and be together. I don't mind. Izuku shakes his head. Did you want me to leave? I, uh, I could catch the train to Kachan's house for a few hours. No. Shota responds far too quickly, studying the teen. I feel like you missed the first half of the conversation. We're asking because we want your honest opinion, kid. We want to know if you're comfortable with her coming here while you're still here, and I prefer you have as little one-on-one -on -one interaction with Bakugo as possible. For my own peace of mind, You'll never need to leave for any reason, sunshine. Hizashi frowns. You don't have to say yes, but if you're comfortable with it or not, no one will be upset. I really don't mind, Izuku tells them honestly, thumb tracing a line along the mug in his hands. I just thought that m maybe you guys would want to be alone because, um, because you, you're sad? Izuku stiffens when he realizes that he almost blew his own cover. He'd almost let slip that he knew why they were sad when neither told him. He doesn't want them to think that he's been snooping or worse, think that there's something wrong with him, like the ability to see ghosts or something. Well, that's a bit far-fetched, even if it is the truth. No one believes that. His guardians share a look before both are glancing at him again. Neither say anything, but they don't stop looking at him like they're trying to understand him or see some underlying hesitance in his words that's not there. Is, is there some reason that today is a sad day? Izuku asks quietly, staring down at the liquid in his mug. He jerks his attention up when he realizes what he'd just asked. I, 
I mean, you don't have to tell me anything if you don't want. I was just curious because you're both upset and, and I don't know, I, I don't know how to help. They stare for a second longer before Hisashi looks away abruptly. He shifts a little before looking back at Izuku with a look that's similar to the one from this morning, but less raw. Today's the birthday of someone who is, was, very important to us. Was? Izuku swallows, hooking one ankle over the other as he inches forward towards the edge of the love seat. He died, Shota shakes his head, voice devoid of any emotion. A long time ago. I'm sorry. Don't be, listener. Hazashi shoots him a light smile. Like Sho said, it was a long time ago. It just gets rough this time of year. He was our best friend. He, well... Hazashi rubs the back of his neck with a fond laugh. He's the reason Sho and I even became friends, let alone the one to play matchmaker for us. He was very important to us. And yeah, that sounds a lot like Obero, sticking his nose in other people's business with the best of intentions. Izuku almost smiles. He sounds like a good friend, Izuku offers lightly, and he knows the words to be true. He'd only known Obero for a short time, but he really was a good friend. He was. Shota bows his head, leaning forward to pick the photo frame up off the coffee table. He stares down at it for a second before handing it to Hizashi. The blonde looks for a second long before stretching out in order to pass it over to Izuku. A small part of Izuku feels strangely honored that they're trusting him with this, that they're letting him in and sharing something, someone, so important to them. He takes the frame into his hands like a crown jewel and finds a tiny smile curling onto his lips as he focuses on Obero's grinning face. I'm sure you can tell which one he is, Shota huffs out with an edge of sad humor. The dark-haired man is glaring down into his drink as he speaks while Hizashi is watching Izuku with a fond look. Izuku, meet Shirakuma Obero. Izuku thumbs the edge of the frame, studying the photo for a second time. This time it doesn't feel like he's prying. It feels like he's a part of this now. It's one thing to hear these things from a ghost, but it's another entirely different thing to hear it from someone living to be let in on something special inside and fed information and stories from a ghost. What do you guys usually do for his birthday? Izuku asked softly, looking up from the frame. Drink, comes Shota's answer. We don't, well, yes, I, I guess we do. We've made it tradition to invite our school friends, Namuri and Tensei. They come over because they were close with Obero too, and we do usually drink, but we won't this year. Why not? Izuku cocks his head. Because we have you, problem child, Shota snorts into his tea. Can't very well get wasted with a minor in the house. That's something no one needs to see, especially someone under legal age. We don't get wasted, Hazashi yelps, glaring at Shota. We have a couple of drinks and then usually crash. And Nam and Tensei sometimes spend the night, but this year we don't even have space for that either. Not to mention Tensei's in the hospital still, so it'll just be Nam coming over. Izuku doesn't pry into it, no matter how much he wants to. But I don't mind you guys drinking if you want. You shouldn't change things for me. You you do this every year. I mind, Shota shrugs. I do too, Hazashi frowns. And we're not changing it for you, kiddo. It'll be different this year anyways. Besides, I have patrol tomorrow morning, so I can't drink anyways. Well, Izuku frowns thoughtfully. What will you guys do instead, then? The two pro heroes exchange a look. Hazashi frowns as Shota's shoulder lifts in a tired shrug. That's a good question, listener. Izashi shakes his head. We'll probably just talk. Maybe watch over his favorite movie again or something. You should bake a cake. For a second, Izuku doesn't realize it had been him who said it. And it sounds dumb. And his teachers are now looking at him like he's grown a second head. Izuku feels an embarrassed flush wash over his cheeks as he abruptly drops his attention back to his lukewarm tea. Cake? Shota sips up more. Curious twinge to his monotone voice. Why? It's, a, uh, um, it's, it's a birthday. Izuku frowns. He feels childish now. It's hardly a birthday without a cake. You want us to make a birthday cake? Hisashi asks slowly, pushing his glasses up his nose, and they start to slip. He's watching Izuku still, head angled like the teen is a complex puzzle that he doesn't understand. W well, Izuku ducks his head, fingers tensing around the rim of his mug. Just when I was little, m my grandma died, and... We were really close, so when her birthday rolled around, I was devastated. We baked the same cake every year for her, and she'd come over and we'd celebrate, and then suddenly she was gone, and I was so sad. Izuku pauses, looking up for a second before continuing. 
My mom, she, she insisted we still, you know, make a cake. So we did. We still baked a birthday cake and decorated it and wrote her name on it in icing. And then when we ate it while thinking about her and telling stories about her, Izuku shakes his head, no scrunching up as he glares down into his drink. Sorry, it's dumb. It's not. Hizashi shakes his head with a light smile. That's really cute, sunshine. And you want us to make a cake for Oboro? Izuku gives a sheepish nod. It was just nice to enjoy something she loved, even if she wasn't around. I, um, I think it helped me grieve. And it's only a little bit of a lie. Or, actually, it was entirely a lie. The truth was, Izuku never met any of his grandparents. They'd all passed on before he was born, and, as far as he knew, none of them hung around in the real world. He feels bad lying to his teachers, making up the heartfelt story, but he knows it's an element of closure both sides need. Normally, he'd never offer something like this up. It sounded silly, but he knew that Obro was still hanging around. He knew his teachers were grieving. He knew that even if Obro couldn't share this, this cake with their company in entirety, the ghost would still be touched at the little details and the gesture. He wanted Obro to feel special, to feel remembered on his birthday, and make it into something light and happy instead of dark and sad. Isuku wants to do something nice for Obero. He sees the way the ghost views this, the grief, the sadness. His friends being sad and hurt over him, that's a feeling that no one likes. It sucks. Obero had been so dejected that morning when he realized that it was his birthday, and Isuku wants to change it. Birthdays are supposed to be happy. Maybe he can make this hurt a little less for his teachers, for the ghost. And a cake is a great way to start, and to do it. Shota's quiet for a second, thoughtful gaze studying the teenager. Izuku almost wants to shrink under his teacher's gaze, but he just pretends not to notice. The boy thinks his homeroom teacher is trying to figure out how to say no without hurting Izuku's feelings, so the boy is thrown for a loop, when instead his teacher looks over towards Hizashi. What was that cake that Obero loved so much? My mom's chocolate cake, Hizashi laughed, sinking back into the couch with a wide grin. I forgot how much he loved that cake. How many slices did he eat that first time we had it again? Your mother cut him off at four, and then he threw up after Nem bet him that he couldn't do a flip on one of his clouds. He almost dropped himself on his head. Right? Hizashi chokes on a hearty laugh, smacking the arm of the couch as he laughs. Then he ate another slice too, didn't he? No. Shota shakes his head, a tiny smile curling onto his lips. The asshole ate my slice. He ate more cake after throwing up? Izuku lets himself smile. He can see it. The whole situation sounds very much like an Obero thing to do. This all sounds very much like Obero things that Obero would never tell Izuku himself, so he's really glad to hear it. He sounds really fun. Izuku knows it to be true, but it's still nice hearing stories of his friend. It's like friends of your friend telling you stories about your friend, but in Izuku's case, it's a bit messier. The friends of his friend are his teachers who are currently fostering him, and who have no idea that Izuku had somehow befriended their dead friend. Complicated. He was. Izashi's smile turns reminiscent. His teachers exchange none of the glance. This time it's softer and almost like they're having a conversation with their eyes. Finally, Shota speaks again, the corner of his lips curled into a small smile, a real one. Still have your mother's recipe? Yep, Izashi grins. And the chocolate fudge icing, too. That cake is incomplete without it. My mother's rules. Well, Shota moves to stand off the couch, Hizashi following his lead. Let's get to baking, then, before Nam arrives and fucks up our kitchen in an attempt to help us. Izuku stands to disappear into his room, ready to let his guardians do this alone when, almost as if predicting Izuku's actions, Shota glances back at the teen. Come on, problem child. Your idea. Your cake. Izuku grins as he turns toward the kitchen instead of the hallway leading to his room following his teachers into the hallway to make a birthday cake for their dead friend and Izuku's ghost friend. What a sentence. Baking with his guardians actually proved to be a lot of fun. The recipe was simple enough to follow, and it was nice to see that his guardians were working together in perfect harmony to bake a cake. Izuku helps too, mostly with mixing the batter, which is honestly the best job anyways. Plus, he gets to lick the whisk, Shota encourages him, and Hisashi whines about him getting sick from raw eggs and uncooked flour. They make the icing while the cake is in the oven baking. Izuku licks the whisk again while they're finished making the icing too, but this time neither guardian has any complaints. And it would be hypocritical to have any complaints, considering Hizashi and Shota are both taking turns dipping their fingers into the empty mixing bowl. Izuku is glad to see that neither look as sad as they had been before. They're laughing and talking, telling Izuku about Obero and sharing little details with each other about their cloud-haired friend. It's nice hearing things from someone other than Obero. 
He likes that they're letting him in and being almost vulnerable around him, which is something Asuku never would have thought his homeroom teacher would ever do. Asuku listens intently as Hizashi raves about their school days with the cloudy-haired teen. Hizashi had apparently met Obro first at the start of their first year, and Obro had coerced Shota into being his friend when the dark-haired man had first joined the heroics course after their own sports festival. The friendship had taken a bit of work, especially when it came to roping in Shota, who sounds like he wasn't much different back then to what he is now. Zuku likes this. He likes seeing them like this. He likes talking about Obro even if he has to play dumb a bit. He likes that they're not upset, and he knows Obro will get a kick out of this as well. He can't wait to see the ghost's face when he gets back. His guardian's friend, Namuri, midnight, arrives before Obro returns. She lets herself in and comes bearing takeaway for dinner and a bottle of wine that Hizashi takes from her and sets aside. Asuka is surprised to see her. She looks very different out of her hero costume, just like Hizashi. She's wearing more clothes than Asuka's ever seen, a long sleeve shirt, a pair of tight-fit jeans. She's got a pair of regular glasses and her hair is up in a neat bun. She's very pretty. Takes a bit longer to place the civilian to the hero costume than it had with Hizashi and present Mike in his getup, but Asuka comes to the conclusion after just a couple minutes with the woman. Asuka's child self would probably have passed out at this point, surrounded by three pro heroes who were all comfortable enough around to let their guards down. I guess we're keeping this get-together PG if the little cutie is hanging out with us. Namuri pouts theatrically as she steps into the kitchen. Do I smell Yamada-san's chocolate cake? We told you the listener would be here, Hizashi reminds with a playful grin. And yeah, we're trying something new this year, huh, kiddo? Obro's favorite. Namuri's face twists into a sad frown for just a second before she's giving them a sly grin, going along with the idea without a second thought. Are you sure it's still his favorite after spewing three slices worth of it in the grass? Four, Shota chimes in gruffly, sticking his frosting-covered finger in his mouth before continuing. And he did eat my piece afterwards. Nasuku thinks his homeroom teacher may be harboring a bit of a grudge about Obro stealing his cake. Just how good is this cake? Shota continues as Izuku drags his thoughts back to the cake and the bustling of the teachers around him. I think it's safe to assume that he'd still love it. Seconded, Hazashi raises his hand after slipping his hands into a set of oven mitts. I've been eating this cake for 30 years and it's still one of my favorites. The oven timer chimes and Amuri cheers as Hazashi pulls the cake from the oven. They look really nice and the room smells of sweet chocolate. The cakes are fluffy, and they've risen nicely. Azuku can't wait to taste the finished product. They can't do much more while the cakes are still hot, since they'll melt if the icing is put on there right now. Azuku disappears into his room so the pros can talk without him around. He has no doubt that Midnight Sensei, no, Auntie Nem, as she requested to be called, Azuku just knows that his face had turned tomato red as he diverted his eyes from the woman. Much to Hizashi and Shota's chagrin, is curious about the abrupt change in their usual plans when it comes to celebrating Obro's birthday. Isuku lays on the bed with Fish and Nemo scrolling through his phone as he waits. Blanket had left to greet the visitor, but the other two cats remained in place. The cake is probably cooled now, and he assumes the teachers are all icing the cake if the voice of varying levels of annoyance and humor is anything to go off of. Honey, I'm home! Izuku looks up at Obro's cheerful call. Just a second later, the teen shivers as the ghost plops down on the bed beside him. How's it hanging, Zuku? Hope Sho and Sashi weren't too depressing while I was gone. You haven't been in here the whole time, have you? Welcome back, Izuku snorts as he pushes himself to a sitting position. No, it's been okay. They're okay, I guess. And I've been waiting for you to come back. I hope your family's all well. They're great, Obro grins brightly. I have a new nephew. Cutest little guy around. They're all adorable. All those little ankle biters. I wish I could have actually met them, you know? Anyways, it was great to see everyone. They're all a lively bunch. Man, it was so much fun to see everyone hanging out. And the kids, they were just so full of energy. Zuku can't help but smile as the ghost continues to talk on about his visit to his family. Obro seems content to just talk to someone who can actually listen. Obro talks so long that Izuku's phone blacks out due to inactivity, but the green-haired teen can't be bothered. Obro pauses in his story when he catches sight of Nemo, who's pressed up against Izuku's thigh, tail swishing as she glares at the ghost. He blinks at the cat before his smile widens. There's only one person in the world that that cat hates more than she hates me, so if Nemo's in here, then that must mean... Obro jumps to his feet. Nem's here, isn't she? She is, Izuku confirms, letting out a quiet laugh as he stands after the ghost. But wait, before you head out there, there's actually a... Well, there's a bit of a surprise for you. For... Me? 
Mobro froze as where he'd been about to charge through the bedroom door and make his way into the kitchen. I don't know what that means, Zuku. You'll like it, as Zuku promises, giving the ghost a light smile as he opens the door for them. As Zuku walks out with Obero following hesitantly on his heels, he really hopes the ghost does like it. The cake smells even better now, the sweet scent of chocolate icing aiding the rich chocolatey cake. Obero pauses, gives a light sniff as his eyebrows furrow. Is that cake? Azuku just smiles as he bounds into the kitchen where his teachers are. The cake is on the table now. Two cakes stacked on top of each other, fully iced. It's not neat or perfect, looking like it was just smoothed on with a butter knife, but it looks homemade and it smells great. Besides, what's it matter what it looks like when it tastes so good, right? Obro freezes in the doorway as Azuku plants his palms on the table beside Hizashi, leaning over to look at it. It looks great, the teen chirps, smiling shyly at the adults. Last time he'd seen it, it was still in the pan's cooling. Now it's an actual cake. Don't lie to us, problem child. Shota draws in his humored monotone. He glares down at the cake distastefully before sighing. At least we know it tastes good. Hey, Hizashi laughs heartily, standing from his seat to stare down at the cake like Izuku is. I think it looks great, too. And the writing on top is just perfect. The top of the cake has squiggles of deep blue gel icing. Suku, he actually spots a small tube of the matching icing beside the cake, mostly empty. He hadn't seen it before, and honestly, didn't know his guardians even had like something like that on hand, but he can't deny seeing Obro's name and wide, loopy scrawl on the top of the cake doesn't make his heart warm. You're only saying that because you did it, Nomori scoffs, one eyebrow arching in an unimpressed sort of way. And I beg to differ. You wrote happy too big, and had like no room for birthday. I mean, look at that. The A and the Y are all squished together and tiny. But I fit Obero just fine. The blonde's lip jots out in a pout, finger pointing down and hovering over where Obero is written in wobbly squiggles. I like it. Besides, I got to use that gel icing I bought for Sho's last birthday, and he blatantly refused to eat on his own cake. It's a win-win all around, and, the man hums out the word with a grin, Obero loves blue. I do like blue. Obero's voice comes out breathless. He hasn't moved still, hasn't stepped in. Hasn't even really seen the cake yet. He looks nervous, afraid to come in, hesitant to join them despite the fact that they're celebrating him. Izuku bites his lip as he subtly gestures the ghost in. Obro takes slow, measured steps into the room, hovering over Izuku's shoulder. He doesn't touch him, but he's very close to hooking his chin over Izuku's shoulder. The height difference between them is the only saving grace. It doesn't look awful, Shota concedes, frown still present, but it is a mess. It's beautiful. Obro breathes out just as the words leave Shota's mouth, voice sounding wobbly. Usuku is sure that if he were to look over his shoulder, the ghost's expression would match the catch in his voice. It's... it's beautiful. You got them too. You guys made... it's really for me? Sure, it's a bit of a mess. Namuri shrugs as she plops onto one of the chairs. But so was Obro. That idiot would have adored this mess of a cake, and we all know it. Well, maybe not you, hon. Izuku almost huffs out an offense as Namuri's fingers ruffle through his hair. Oh, the irony of that. Obro snorts out a laugh into his fist, his eyes still a little teary and voice crumpling, no matter how hard he tries to keep it together. I guess I can give credit for this one to you, huh, Zuku? The teen's head dips faintly in a nod, which is followed by a light shrug. A little, but he just sparked the idea. Shoda and Hizashi had run with it, and making Obro's favorite and icing it together with their other friends for the sake of the ghost. He didn't want full credit for this when it wasn't about him in the slightest. He's just glad that everything feels light and the ghost has a grin on his face that is somehow the brightest Izuku has ever seen. I have never loved anything as much as I love this cake, the ghost coos, flashing Izuku a wide smile before stepping through the table and ducking down so his nose is almost pushed against the frosting on top. It would be unsanitary if the ghost wasn't, you know, a ghost. That's my name. Wow, it's been so long since I've seen it written out. Can't believe you got them to make me a cake. Can't believe you got Shoda, Mr. Logic and Rationality, to bake me a cake. Best ghost birthday ever. And now Azuku's smiling like an idiot, because he'd expected Obero to be happy, but not this happy. Not genuinely ecstatic to see it, still. The thought and sight of Obero so over the moon about this makes Azuku feel all warm and squishy. The cake is such a small thing. Tiny in comparison to extravagant birthday parties or big get-togethers for someone's birthday. It had taken no more than a couple of hours from start to finish, but it had made Obro so happy and giddy. Completely cheered the ghost up, not to mention 
liven the whole apartment. Everyone seemed in a better spirit because of it. Shoda insisted that they eat real food, the takeout that Namuri brought before they ate the cake. Namuri groaned and called the two men boring dads, and Izuku's cheeks definitely did not flush red at their words, no matter what a chortling Oboro had to say about it. But they did all settle down to eat. Conversations continued, mostly revolving around Oboro. Namuri had some interesting stories of the cloudy-haired teenager, too, and Izuku was happy to listen. She was a year ahead of Oboro, Hizashi and Shoda, but they were all so close of friends. He walked directly into my homeroom sensei because he was too busy trying to keep pace with me, Namuri laughed, sipping at the wine that she brought. Shoda and Hizashi had caved, each having a glass as well, after making sure Izuku was fine with it, and of course he was. Sensei was so mad, and Oboro, all he could do was stumble over his words, I swear. He said sorry three times before fleeing the room like a dog with his tail between his legs. I'm surprised the poor kid didn't wet himself. It wasn't that bad, Oboro pouts, looking at Izuku. But to plead my case, 3A's homeroom teacher that year was pro-hero pride. With that scary lion mutation quirk, he was so possessively protective of his class, and he had very large teeth. Izuku tried really hard not to laugh, stifling it into his sleeve. To be fair, Azashi snickers, Pride Sensei never did like Oboro. Well, yeah, he was always hanging around our classroom when he wasn't being an idiot with you two, or riding those clouds everywhere. Nezu used to get so pissed when he saw Oboro on his clouds. He only hung around because he liked you, Shota teases, lip remaining in a straight line despite the tone. He was willing to risk his life intruding in Pride Sensei's classroom just to talk with you. He did? Izuku squawks, attention shooting to the ghost, who suddenly had... A lot more color on his cheeks. Now that you mention it, Namori lets out another laugh. Yeah, that would explain it. He was like my little shadow whenever he was around. He was really sweet, though. Isuku still hadn't dragged his gaze away from the flushing ghost. Hey, Oboro pouts when he catches Izuku's gaze, smile still bright on his face despite the pink crawling up his features. She was an upperclassman who was nice and pretty. Sue me. I'm pretty sure Nem had her whole class, excluding those two lovesick idiots, drooling whenever she stepped into the room. Obro pauses for a second, a smile curling onto his lips. She thinks I'm sweet. Izuku does accidentally let a laugh out at the dopey lull in his voice, ducking his head as he does so. That was pretty bad, Hizashi hums thoughtfully, smile turning mischievous. But what about when Obro came into class soaking wet and proceeded to shed all of his clothes right in the middle of the classroom, with our sensei in the room? Really? Izuku can't help but squawk it out, second-hand embarrassment lifting to his own cheeks as he chances a glance back at a smug-looking Oboro. I'm not a prude, the ghost shrugs, a toothy smile on his face. He doesn't look embarrassed at all, just proud. And I covered all the goods with a cloud. No one saw anything, I think. Not that it would have mattered. I ain't shy. What? Namuri is bent over laughing. No one told me that. Oh yeah, Shota hums, a tiny smile on his face as he recalls it. That was the day he found sushi. Came in late, soaked from the rain, stripped down to nothing but that customary sensor cloud he made. Idiot. Sensei was so done with him, Hazashi manages out between booming laughter. It's very close to being quirk active, but it doesn't get to that point. Man, I wish I had that kind of confidence. I mean, our whole class was in the room. It's a gift. Obro draws in as a tease. Izuku covers his own face in secondhand embarrassment that Obro isn't even firsthand embarrassed about, and it had been him who'd done it. His confidence really is unrivaled. Zuku's not sure even Kachan would have had the gall to do that, and he's the most confident person that Zuku's ever known. It's not long after dinner that everything is cleared away, the four of them, and the ghost, are preparing for the cake that had been waiting on the counter. Obro stood behind Izuku, in his chair, leaning on the back of the chair that he's staring down at the cake with a small smile as the teenager grabs forks for the group, Hizashi grabbing plates. Izuku freezes when he notices a small package of candles in the utensil drawer that obviously had been dropped in at some point and forgotten about. He runs a finger over the box before grabbing it and the four forks that he'd been directed to grab before returning to the table. Can we light a candle too? He bounds over to Shota, stopping just beside him. The man blinks in surprise before looking first at Hizashi, then to Murray. He looks like he wants to say no, but before he can continue, Izuku does. It's not a birthday without a candle, is it? You really are pushing your luck, Obro laughs, a little breathy, his eyes tracking the candles, hopefully despite his words. Shota huffs out a breath, through his nose, before holding his hand out. Just one. Izuku hasn't felt this childish since he was literally a child. 
since before he got his quirk and he had all this to himself. He's not sure why it feels so nice to do this for Obro, to give him something he hasn't had in years, but it, it does. It makes him feel a little giddy, too. The teen carefully places the package of candles in his guardian's hand, and Shota easily opens the pack and selects one. He presses the candle onto the cake between the words birthday and Obero, then stands up and pulls one of the drawers as Zuko had never bothered looking in and produces a lighter from it. Shota and Hizashi settle at the table at the same time, with Hizashi with the plates and a knife to cut the cake with, while Shota is thumbing at a lighter as he waits. When everyone settled at the table, Shota finally leans forward to light it. Izuku watches the small flame flicker before steadying out. Everyone around the table just looks at the cake for a second. No one says anything. Not even Obro, whose eyes track the flame's movement intently. His smile is nothing more than an upward curl of his, the corner of his mouth, but it's fond and heartening. It's not too big. It's not a flashy, show smile. It's an innocent little thing. Who's going to blow it out? Nomuri asks after a second, looking between her two friends. They were always closer, to Obro anyway. Me, the ghost hoots, and it takes everything in Izuku not to look over his shoulder at the ghost who sucks in a deep breath before leaning over Izuku and blowing hard. Izuku will give him credit for the fact that the flame does flicker, as if a breeze swept over it, but it doesn't go out. Aw. Obro lets out a huff before leaning even closer to the cake, one arm stretched out before him, while the other supports him by his forearm resting above the length of the back of Izuku's chair. The teen holds his breath as the ghost concentrates on the flame, fingers circling around it before he pinches the wick. And the candle goes out. Hizashi jumps in surprise as a small stream of smoke lifts from the smothered flame, and Amuri's chair scratches faintly on the floor as she pushes back in surprise. Shota's eyes widen a fraction, but he doesn't move. I did it. Obro puffs out his chest, clearly proud. What the? Burr! Izuku gives a fake little shiver, followed by a real one as the ghost resumes his close position and surrounds the teen with his ghostly chill. The candle must have gotten caught in that breeze. Breeze? Shota looks around the room with narrowed eyes, gaze catching on the teen again from when he can't find a source for it. From where? Izuku opens his mouth to answer, but promptly shuts it instead, answering with a shrug. There are no open windows. No hot windows in the kitchen at all, so he doesn't know what he could blame so it's better to just keep his mouth shut. Well, now no one has to blow it out, Namuri laughs, though she still looks a little startled by the candle going out on its own, by a breeze that no one felt but the teenager. You know, I'm just going to believe that Obro did it, as Ashi lets out a laugh, brushing the incident off as a little easier than Namuri. Happy birthday, buddy. Izuku almost chokes on his spit, and he feels the ghost lose his lean on the solid backrest of the chair, flailing around as he falls through faintly before catching himself and pushing up to stare in awe at the blonde school friend. That's literally impossible. Shota shakes his head, lips pulling in a frown. Illogical. But it's a nice thought, isn't it? Izashi coos, crossing his arms and across his chest defiantly. Besides, it was perfect timing. Over a blue that candle out. You can't change my mind. Not with your silly logic, Shochan. Believe what you want. The underground hero sighs, still looking at the candle like it was about to suddenly relight without intervention from them. And don't call me that. Sourpuss, Namuri snorts into her glass of wine. Someone cut the cake already. It's been years since I've had a slice of Yamada-san's cake. It's long overdue for a foodgasm. A, a what? Mizuku blinks at the woman. Hisashi gives her a shove, shooting her a death glare as Shota just drops his head into his hands. Don't teach him things like that, Hisashi scolds. What? It's not like I'm talking about my favorite other gasm. The woman purrs out, just trying to get a rise out of the blonde, who squawks and flaps his arm around into its belief. The Murray. Shota huffs through his palms. He suddenly sounds exhausted. I swear to God. Fine, fine. The woman gives a bright laugh, sipping her wine again. Someone cut the cake already, then. Izuku retires to his room when Shota and Izashi do. Namuri had left a while before, complaining about an early morning patrol and needing a good night's sleep to be on her game for it. Izuku had hung around with his guardians to help clean up and wash dishes. They told him he didn't need to, but he insisted on helping. They'd quieted down a little, not quite as upbeat and cheerful anymore. The grief was slowly returning, but it was a half-thought instead of a constant. They were still sad, and Izuku knew they always would be, no matter how they were celebrated. He understood that. He flops down on his bed and groans into the pillow when a cold presence settles at his side. Thank you. 
A seeker rolls onto his side, hugging the stuffed cat his guardians had bought for him to his chest. What for? I know they wouldn't have done this, made me a cake and, and celebrated me, instead of mourning me if it wasn't for you, so, so thanks. It was amazing. I haven't felt that included, alive, in years. I'm just glad you had a good birthday, the teen replies, letting his eyes slip shut. He feels the smile twisting his lips, and he doesn't even attempt to hide it. He's very happy that Obro had a good day. I did. Asuku can hear the tiny smile in Obro's voice. There's only one thing that can make this birthday even better. Oh, yeah? Asuku hums out, slivering one eye open to glance at him. And what would that be? A ride on one of my clouds? The ghost cheers, head angling to look out the window. I tell you, Zuku, you haven't seen the stars until you've seen them from a cloud. It was always my favorite thing to do. Really? Izuku finds himself sitting up. Oh, yeah. The ghost gives a serious nod, shifting around so he's sitting on the edge of the bed. It's just so calm up there. You don't hear any city sounds, and no one bothers you, plus the stars are gorgeous from up there, bright and up close, sparkling. It's the best. Obro stares out the window for a second before he's slowly turning to Izuku. The teen blinks as... Obro's intense eyes focus on him, the ghost smile stretching wider by the second. Have you ever, oh, I don't know, wanted to stargaze from a cloud? Um, Izuku frowns, inching away from the ghost. He already knows where this is going, can see it just from the mischievous glint in Obro's eyes. I don't know. Wouldn't it be fun? The ghost bounces on the edge of the mattress, eyes sparkling and smile wide and toothy. Come on, it's my birthday. The ghost's eyes turn pleading and his lip pouts out a bit. Please... You just want to use your quirk, Izuku groaned, burying his face into the pillow before scooching to the edge of the bed so that he could plant his feet on the ground. What if Shoda and Hizashi come check on me, and I'm not here and they think I snuck out or something? They won't, Obro snorts. They trust you. Sashi's already getting ready for bed at this hour, because of his early patrol and Shoda's marking your class essays. It's not like we're going to be gone all night. It'll be an hour, tops. Come on! You're not going to deny the ghost who's been all alone on his birthday for 13 years this, are you? Guilt tripping is so not cool, Izuku pouts, but offers up his hand anyway. An hour, and if I get caught sneaking out, I, well, I don't know what I'll do. I'll figure it out, but you'll be sorry. Yes, Obro cheered as he stepped close to Izuku, hand clamping down on the green-haired teen's hand. The touch was instantaneous, and for a second Izuku was afraid at how easy it had become. Obro was solid pulling Izuku up by the hand and dragging him towards the window. Somehow, Obro managed to push the window open with just one hand, and then Izuku was gazing out at a large, fluffy cloud. It was big enough to comfortably seat the two of them, but Izuku still hesitated. You know, if we accidentally let go, you'll probably float, because weightless ghost who has no solid form without me and all, but I will... I'll plummet to my death. We won't let go. Obro huffs, half amused, half annoyed, look lulling in Izuku's direction as he does so. That doesn't make me any more confident in this, Izuku shakes his head. We're literally dangling my life from a cloud. You've seen how easy it is for us to lose contact. Do you really want to do that in the sky? Okay, okay, point made, Obro thinks for a second before Izuku is dragged to the wardrobe where his uniforms are hanging. The ghost tugs one of his red uniform ties down from the hanger, pushing up close to Izuku so their hips were touching before releasing the teen's hand. Obro makes quick work of knotting the tie around first his hand and then Izuku's. The ghost laces their fingers together without a word, wrapping the tie around their hands like an odd present of some sort. The knots were almost tight enough to hurt, but he couldn't argue that they weren't secure. Obro gives a jolting tug of the bindings and Izuku stumbles at the force, tugged into Obro's side. He glares at the ghost, but Obro just looks smug as he lightly pushes Izuku back onto his feet. There. Obro gives a firm nod, inspecting his work. Nothing short of untying that will break the connection, and we can always have a second point of contact, too, like our knees touching or something. Now. The ghost whines, almost pleading. Can we go? Yeah, Izuku swallows, glancing back at the cloud, hovering completely still outside the window. Let's do it. Obero climbs onto the cloud first, looking entirely too giddy, considering Izuku was walking into something that was going to be taking him upwards and could literally blink him out of existence, with just one wrong move from the two of them. Best not to think about that. His steps are slow and cautious as he climbs out the window, heart thrumming with nerves and anxiety at being caught, and the thrill of actually sneaking out and trusting not just his own ghost-seeing and sort of using quirk, but Obro's own cloud quirk, too. 
The ghost sinks down into a crisscross position, pulling Izuku down too. The teen melts into a similar position, squeezing at his friend's hand. Relax. Obro gives him a half-smile that's a little goofy. I used to do this all the time. I won't let anything happen to you, trust me. And he does trust the ghost. He just doesn't let his grip up. The cloud is moving before Zuku really knows what's happening. They're going up. Not like how they'd gone up and stayed to the side like at the USJ. No, they were just going up, like as Zuku was on one big, cottony elevator. The higher they got, the harder his heart was thrumming in his chest, pounding like it would beat right out of his ribcage. The wind ruffles through his curls, and his body gives a shiver at the late-night chill brushing against them. At his side, Obro looks free and alive, a natural smile on his face, and his eyes shut as he directs the cloud as if it's second nature. The ghost's head is angled upwards, chin raised as he accepts the wind and chill like it's a part of him. Izuku doesn't doubt for a second that Obro did this all the time when he was alive. It's obvious that the ghost missed this, being free like this, guiding his clouds where few could go, being able to just hop on a cloud and go. Izuku looks down at the tall buildings. As they get smaller and smaller, the cars below look like nothing but ants, and stray pedestrians wandering around can't even be picked out by his eyes. Soon they're surrounded by natural clouds, which is where Obero stops the movement. His eyes sliver open and his head angles towards Izuku, taking him in before his head is thrown back, and he's staring up at the stars in awe. Look up, the ghost guides, his own hand giving Izuku a light, prompting squeeze. Pretty, huh? Izuku lets his head follow the direction on autopilot, eyes lifting to the scattering of stars above. They really are beautiful twinkling like the nursery rhyme his mother used to sing to him, glittering above. He wishes he knew more about the stars, about constellations and names, more than just the North Star that he couldn't even point out if he tried. It really is beautiful, a sight that he's sure few ever see like this. Yeah, Izuku hears himself say, unable to draw his eyes away. Thanks for talking me into this. Thanks for letting me talk you into this. Oro bursts out into laughter what draws the teen's gaze away from the sky. This really was the best birthday I've had in ages. Thank you, Izuku. Izuku bows his head in acknowledgement, attention crawling back up to the sky. I never did ask how old you were turning. The teen hums. Obviously older than me, but like, how old? Thirty-one, the ghost returns softly, just as distracted by the sky and the stars. Izuku sputters, choking on the spit in his mouth. Obro looks towards him in surprise, but he has to bite his lip to keep from laughing at Izuku's choking coughs and red cheeks. You're old, the teen accuses, disbelief furrowing his brow. I forgot you're as old as my teachers, because you look, well, like that. Izuku, Obro's nose wrinkles as he grins. The green-haired teen can see the shit-eating grin on Obro's face, even in the dark, that tongue-in-cheek kind of smile. Buddy, I'm older than your teachers. You're what? Izuku chokes out a couple more exclamations that don't quite fit into real words, but they're drowned out by the ghost's hearty laughter. Izuku doesn't really complain when they stay out 15 more minutes than Izuku had even approved. He just is glad to see Obro smiling so much and enjoying himself. They really need to work with the ghost's quirk some more because this, this is amazing. This concludes Chapter 19 of UA Survival Guide. Chapter 20 will be next, and as always, thank you all so much for listening.